All right, well, I would, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone tonight. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Brad Kreitz. I'm the president of uh, the undergraduate student government, um, and, and we're excited to have this opportunity for students tonight to um, interact with uh, uh, this panel, this impressive panel that has uh, uh, so graciously joined us in the front row. I would like to introduce them so that you know who is here, um, but first I, I want to just kind of go over a couple um, housekeeping type uh, agenda items. Um, I, I wanted to let you know, I felt like it was um, in all fairness to let you know that we are uh, recording tonight. Um, uh, there will be a video and audio recording of tonight and it's uh, for the hope that those who were unable to make it due to evening exams or w whatever the circumstance may be, have an opportunity to get some of the same answers and information that you guys received tonight. So. Um, we, uh, I ask that when we open it up to the question and answer session, you uh, work with me as we have this microphone um, for you and, and that you try to project your voice well enough so that uh, it's able to be picked up um, and uh, the, so that the video turns out uh, as good as it can. So um, with that aside, um, I'd first like to introduce a, a couple of the students who are with us. Um, we have our uh, student trustee and the board of trustees, Tyler Takel. Um, we have uh, the student commissioner on the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, Keith Hansen. Um, and from the university, we're joined by the president, um, France Cordova. <laughs> we're joined by the executive vice president for business and finance and treasurer, Al Diaz. <laughs> we're joined by the provost. Tim Sands. We're joined by Senior Vice President for Business Services and Assistant Treasurer Jim Allman. And Director of Physical and Capital Planning Ken Sandel. Um, I, I want to, we also have with us the president of the graduate student government, um, Andy Robinson, Robinson um, and we have quite a strong grad presence here, which is great because I, I think it speaks to the nature of this event, and that is that all students, um, regardless of semester classification or even undergrad versus grad versus professional versus doctorate, um, do take a stake in this university and, and are very passionate um, about Purdue and I think that this is an incredible opportunity for us to really engage in a good dialogue with the university um, and and ask any questions um, get any information that will be useful to us and take an opportunity to uh, make sure that the the student voice is heard um, in all of this process so I, I would first like to introduce um, President Cordova um, to start out the night um, we will um, the first half of tonight will be presentations to kind of show you where we've been and where we're going and give you some uh, facts um, and, and hopefully um, enable you to be able to ask uh, informed questions during the second half. And then obviously the second half will be your opportunity uh, to really engage in the dialogue. Um, so without further ado, President Cordova. Good evening, everyone. Let's see if I can get this on. It's really great to see you here, so many of you here. OK, can everybody hear me? All right, good, good. Well, first of all, uh, this is just a great university when on Tuesday night you can go to an outstanding basketball game and watch us eke out a real important victory against Illinois and say goodbye to a couple of superb seniors. And then on Wednesday night, you can go to the Blue Man concert and watch balls flying around the audience and see a former student trustee dragged up into the, the front to uh, do an act with the, with the Blue Man. And then on Thursday night, be with the student forum. I mean, that is just <laughs> what an amazing week. And, um, and actually, that's really the reason we're, we're all here and you all are so interested in this conversation is because it's about keeping Purdue amazing. Several of us have been uh, at and around the State House all day. In fact, we just drove back from Indianapolis. We talked with some of our state senators, including the head of the State Budget Committee, 
uh, Senator Luke Kenley, and we talk with some of our commissioners, including uh, the uh, Commissioner Teresa Lovers, the head of uh, the Indiana Commission on Higher Education, about the same subject that we're going to be talking about today. And uh, running through the theme of it all is how to not only maintain Purdue's excellence, but make sure that it, it can become even better. And we, we all want that. It adds value to your degree. Years from now, when you look back at this experience and you look at what Purdue's become uh, at that time, you'll be really proud that you contributed towards taking Purdue to the next level. So um, before I just introduce how we're going to uh, talk and give you some background on this subject before we open it up for Q&A, I do want to make a couple of announcements. In between our meetings at the State House and our meetings with the Commission, we stopped by the women's basketball game today. Uh, Purdue was playing IU at Conseco Fieldhouse. It's the, it was the first game, and we played it against Indiana, IU, and, uh, and we won. So yes. <laughs> So for those of you who can turn on with any of your devices, tomorrow we'll be playing Penn State at 11.30 a.m. Another, uh, and completely a world away, over in Egypt, a Purdue alumnus, Purdue civil engineering graduate, Dr. Essam Sharaf, has uh, been named the Prime Minister of Egypt. So that's, that's impressive. That's, that's called launching tomorrow's <laughs> leaders, right? <laughs> All right. Well, um, let me also take this opportunity to thank Brad and to thank Andy for just providing superb leadership for the students. I meet with them regularly. In fact, yesterday was kind of our monthly tag-up day, and we uh, have separate me meetings, and we go through a lot of student issues. And you should just be very proud of their efforts at being thoroughly engaged in the things that are important to you and extracting a lot of meaningful things from the administration, which is what it's all about. Over the last year, we've been engaged in something called the biennial budget appropriations process. So what does that mean? That means like unlike some states where they have an annual appropriation process, we have uh, one every two years. And, that, and it sets the budget, including the tuition and fees, for the next two years. And actually, that's, uh, you know, it has a, an up and a downside. The upside is that it's just once every two years you go through all this. Um, and uh, the downside, since it's once every two years, it's got to be really important and count because whatever happens is going to last for two years. So it's an important process. In my remarks at the end of our treasurer's remarks, I'll just talk a little bit about how we have to look ahead at kind of a longer course of looking at what kind of funding revenue sources are out there because this budget uh, biennial budget process is a pretty grueling one and as you'll see from some of the presentation material uh, the state has kind of fixed resources and if we're truly going to become an even better institution and provide more opportunities for students going forward then we're going to have to look at new revenue sources so I've uh, so far testified three times in front of the state legislature this year and we have another one to look forward to in another week or two so let me introduce Al Diaz your treasurer who's going to uh, come up here and give you it as abbreviated background as we're able to to get the general framework of the budget landscape and then as I said I'll come up and say a few remarks but we want to save the majority of the time and we'll stay here all night or almost all night we'll stay here as long as you will to answer your questions thank you Thank you, France. And uh, uh, can everybody see the, the okay, great, that's, that's terrific. Um, uh, and for those of you that uh, you know, might be interested in any of these charts, I, I don't know uh, uh, if when the video is done you'll be able to see them on the video, but all of these charts are posted on the uh, budget website uh, 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 as part of the President's <laughs> Forum presentation. Uh, there may be one that isn't on that, but uh, I think for the most part they're on that. And so uh, you don't need to take notes, uh, just uh, kind of uh, sit back and relax, and if you want us to go back to anything, we can do that. So uh, let me start out. Uh, we, we are... Uh, 
doesn't seem to be open. Okay. Um, a little primer on the on the uh, Purdue budget. So what you're looking at is a, a pie chart that shows a totality of 2.2 billion dollars, which is the full system, full budget from all fund sources, um, and uh, the West Lafayette portion of that, uh, all fund sources again, is 1.88 billion dollars. The rest of it is uh, the uh, uh, regional campuses. Um, I won't be focusing on the regional campuses beyond this point, not because it isn't important, but because I think most of you are interested in the West Lafayette budget, and because the, the uh, parameters that affect the budget elements are different at the regional centers than they are at uh, West Lafayette. So this is uh, an eye test, uh, and so uh, let me point out just a couple of uh, salient features here. Um, the first is that uh, this is the uh, total of the revenue sources for fiscal year 11, which is the year that we're in, fiscal year 10-11. Um, and, uh, and so this takes the $1.8 billion that we talked about earlier, and it breaks it up into its component parts. 50% of the $1.8 billion is what we call the general fund. The general fund is the portion of the budget that is uh, devoted to the education mission of the university. The rest of it uh, is also very important, but to one degree or another is not available to achieve that mission. So for instance, 26% is shown here as restricted funds. Restricted funds typically come from sources where the use of the funds is determined by the giver of the funds. So our federal grants, uh, uh, gifts, and donations are, are in uh, that uh, uh, category. Also, we have in the blue self-supporting auxiliary funds. So this is largely um, athletics and uh, uh, housing and food services. And in this case, uh, there's a transaction that takes place that has nothing to do with the mission of the, uh, the teaching mission of the university, but where, uh, where uh, uh, resources are, are conveyed or exchanged in exchange for some physical uh, good or uh, in the case of uh, athletics, uh, uh, attending a, a game. Um, and then the, the balance of the half that isn't the general fund is student aid. These are budgeted student aid funds that come from the federal government or come from the state uh, and uh, obviously are available only for supporting the students uh, in, in, uh, uh, directly. And so uh, the general fund is what we'll focus on uh, for just another couple of uh, charts. So the general fund comes from three sources principally uh, or, or three areas. Uh, one is from the state. The state uh, provides us 27% of our uh, general funds in the form of an operating appropriation. That is funds that are used to operate the uh, university uh, physically uh, and uh, 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 as a, uh, a physical system and pay people. The state funds for uh, debt financing, which comprise only about 3%, uh, it also comes from the state, and what that is is the payment on debt that's associated with building buildings or uh, what have you, typically building buildings. What you can see is that two-thirds of the general fund comes from student tuition and fees, and, uh, uh, or almost two-thirds. And the balance of it, 10%, uh, we call other income. Other income uh, includes... Um, uh, the biggest portion of other income, and, and remember, 10% would mean that's about $90 million. About $60 million of that is indirect cost recovery from uh, grants. So we get uh, um, a grant from the federal government. It comes in two pieces, a, a direct piece that supports the activities, pays salaries, and, and procures goods and services. Uh, another piece that's the indirect cost that's associated with the university support of that activity. And so about two-thirds of the other income is that indirect cost recovery uh, 
The balance of it is from a variety of sources. Some of it is from uh, the endowment uh, uh, and interest on funds that we hold on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but in, in for all intents and purposes, other than 10% of the general fund, the balance of it comes from either the state or students, with the largest element coming from the students. So this is uh, a history of our uh, uh, appropriation for the past uh, uh, 10 years or so. And uh, what you can see is that, uh, and this is, this is not adjusted for inflation. This is uh, simply the nominal uh, numbers. What you can see is that uh, today, uh, the governor's recommendation, the recommended budget that went to the legislature, is within $2 million of what the budget was in 2003 and 4. Now, that's notwithstanding the fact that um, the CPI, that's the Consumer Price Index, has uh, decreased our buying power over that same period by about 20%. Um, if you look at the, what's called the Higher Education Price Index, which uh, is the package of goods and services that are more associated with university operations, that deflator is about 30%. And so what that means is that uh, that $230 million today is worth about 20 to 30% less than it was uh, back uh, in 2003 uh, and four. And so that's what the, the history has, uh, has, has been. Um, And so recognizing that uh, uh, we would be going into uh, a budget cycle this time uh, that uh, would probably not provide us with any more funds than we had uh, uh, this year. And this year, our uh, appropriation from the uh, state uh, is at $241 million. That's what, the, what this indicates. Uh, we started planning uh, over a year ago, uh, in fact, a year and a half ago now, November of 2009, we started planning uh, around the premise that we wouldn't be getting any more than the $241 million, and we wanted to come up with a strategy that would allow us to operate the university through the next biennium with that $241 million without increasing tuition. And so that's what we did. We, we identified the reductions we would have to make in the budget in order to operate on $241 million uh, for this uh, coming biennium without increasing uh, tuition. And this chart gives you uh, an indication, again, a, an eye chart, but uh, gives you an indication of what the uh, uh, actions are that we have uh, planned. Um, you can see on the left-hand column the things that were already underway to deal with the reductions that we encountered in the previous biennium. So the current uh, year is actually lower than uh, the previous year. Uh, there was an 8% reduction in the, from uh, the last biennium to this, uh, and that was accommodated by budget actions, but also by a student fee increase of 5% for in-state students and 6% for out-of-state students. And so that's... Uh, uh, that's what we did then. What we have now is a plan that would uh, reduce our operating budget uh, for the next biennium by $67.5 million. Um, and uh, as a contingency against uh, future uh, uh, or further reductions, we had identified the fact that uh, uh, if we went beyond that point, we might need to increase uh, uh, tuition and fees. And what this down in the right-hand corner indicates is that a 1% change in tuition and fees uh, nets about $4.8 million, about $5 million per 1% of uh, uh, tuition and fee increase. So one of the questions is, so w w what, what does the university spend my money on? And this is uh, uh, designed to indicate that. Uh, now, what we focused on here is the allocations that have been made over the course of the past uh, 10 years. Since 2002, we have allocated $380 million. Now, what does that mean? That means that back in, uh, in 2002, our budget, our operating budget, the general fund, 
expenditure plan was just over $500 million. It now stands at about $400 million more than that, at $907 million. And this is the list of things that uh, approximately accounts for uh, what that, that expenditure plan was. And what you can see is that uh, uh, more than a third of, of it went into compensation and benefits increases for uh, employees, 8% or uh, uh, about uh, 30, uh, uh, Thirty-two million dollars went into scholarships. Uh, another eight percent has gone into fee remissions, and then the the rest of them you can see here. Uh, if you're looking for about a seventy-five percent break, uh, you get down through IT research, new faculty, and uh, utilities. And if you take all of that and what's in the uh, the what isn't in the white hand. Uh, area that accounts for 75 percent of the uh, of the expenditure. What you can also see is that uh, you know it goes down to the point of saying one percent went into library uh, periodicals. M many things that are increasing at faster than the rate of inflation, uh, and so many of these things we had to add money to uh, to to uh, continue to be able to purchase, and so. This is the, the list of the items that uh, uh, we spend the tuition and fees, as well as the state uh, uh, appropriation on. So um, I um, only wanted to talk about one further uh, item, uh, and I'll uh, go on to that right now. And it has to do with repair and rehabilitation. Now, I don't know how, uh, what, what many of you think about the condition of our facilities. We tend to believe that the facilities are in, in pretty good shape for the most part. But we have reached a point where one of the uh, ways that we uh, uh, renovate facilities, that is, uh, uh, is uh, to uh, bring them back to uh, current operating standard, one of the ways we do that is to tear them down and build a, a, a new. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, we, don't, we, we haven't been able to consistently invest in what's called repair and rehabilitation. Now, there are various metrics that are used for how much repair and rehabilitation ought to be uh, uh, budgeted. Uh, some of them go as high as 1.5% of the current replacement value of the facilities. But it really does depend on the condition of the facilities. And so we've done an assessment of what the, a comprehensive assessment of what the, the, uh, uh, the condition of our facilities are to come up with uh, an idea of where we are with respect to repair and rehabilitation. Our cur the current replacement value of the West Lafayette Academic and Administration Buildings, now this doesn't include the residences and it doesn't include the, uh, the, um, um, <coughs> the facilities uh, for uh, the um, uh, athletics, but the current replacement value for West Lafayette's academic and administration buildings is $4.4 billion. Our deferred R&R backlog, meaning the amount of money that we know we need to spend on these facilities to keep them up to current standards, is about $430 million. Um, the annual R&R funding need to keep us from having that backlog grow any further is $30 million. Um, and the annual university internally supported R&R is $9.1 million. So there's a, a s significant gap. And one of the things that we're working on now is the fact that the state, because of the economic conditions, has not been in a, con a position to uh, help us very much with this. And in fact, uh, what you can see is that over the past five uh, uh, biennia, uh, the uh, uh, the backlog has increased almost $100 million. And so this is just an issue that's in the, in the background. It's one that we need to address and uh, uh, will have some implications on the way we, uh, we resolve the budget issues that we have right now. And so with that, I was going to uh, stop and uh, uh, turn it back over to uh, Dr. Cordova, who will talk about not only what, where we are now, but uh, where we'll be going in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Sal. All right. So, um, so, so where, where have we been? 
where does it look like we're going as far as state uh, funding is concerned? That's shown on this figure here. So what you're looking at is money uh, on the on the y-axis there uh, versus time here. So this is a this is a couple of decades. This is all the way since 1990 there, and the the blue line shows the actual and this has all been adjusted uh, for the consumer price index. So that's in in uh, 2010 dollars. So the blue line shows the actual operating appropriations from the state. And so you see it really fluctuates, right? It goes way down, and then goes up, and it's all raggedy. And this is kind of the, uh, the every two year sort of budget engagement that, we're, that we do. And you see recently it's, you know, it's really taken another zoom down. And then the red line is just kind of a smooth line sh through it, showing that for the last two decades, in, e even though it sometimes goes up, and sometimes goes down, it, it's inexorably just headed downwards at the rate of about a percent a year. So we discussed this with the uh, few commissioners that we met with today, and they agree. And everybody has you know, slightly different numbers, depending on whether you throw in debt service or these um, uh, scholarships that the state gives called SASE grants and so forth. But, but no one argues that our state funding situation, looking out into the future, and you see some future there, uh, is, is going to, that all of a sudden we're going to end up with more state funding. And uh, that's not because the state doesn't love higher education, it really does. And in fact, we are, uh, and acknowledge that we are in a better position than a lot of the states uh, around us and um, uh, all through the country. But, but that, uh, there are a lot of pressures on the state, including um, property tax caps and, and prisons and the, uh, the cost of that, but, but predominantly me Medicaid uh, costs and that states have to match the federal contribution <coughs> to that, that inexorably drive up the entitled portion of the budget and drive down its, uh, its capacity to fund discretionary portions. And we are discretionary. And so then you, you'll just see the state contribution just um, inevitably getting less and less. So, so how are we going to handle that for the future? Well, every two years, we're going to be at the State House, and we're going to be asking for Purdue and higher education's fair share. And certainly K through 12 is, and there are big needs there. But we realize if we are going to continue to be a great university and become the university that we aspire to, which is even greater, is that we are going to have to look ahead. And we're going to have to, you know, remember the wedge that the treasurer showed you called other revenue that was 10% right now of the general funds? We're going to have to expand that wedge. And we're going to have to look at how we're going to get other sources of revenue uh, in very creative ways so we have capacity to grow and become ev even better. So could we have the next slide, please? So looking ahead, wh what, are, what are the goals? We want to sustain our momentum in spite of the challenges that were faced uh, with the economy. We want to uh, achieve our goals for excellence and learning and research and engagement. Um, we want to maintain our autonomy of governance, and I just want to take a little pause here to talk about that. There is a proposal from the House Ways and Means Committee uh, in front of the legislature right now, as of a week or two ago, that has a little part of it that, that uh, recommends turning over the autonomy on tuition and fees from the trustees where it presently resides to um, uh, ultimately the state budget director. So this would have the state controlling where our tuition and fees are. Now this hasn't passed or anything. It's part of the, as I said, the House budget submission. So the Senate has to weigh in with its own budget and then there's uh, a period where they compromise and hopefully by April 30th we'll have the final budget. But this is a very important consideration because I would argue, as would any president of a great university, that what has kept our universities in this country great is the autonomy, that's the control over the governance of all things to do with 
where the university is headed by the Board of Trustees, who is, after all, uh, the members are appointed by the governor. And so we think that's a very important uh, sub-story that's going on right now. And so we're in there talking with people. I'm sure our trustees will weigh in too, but we want to preserve the trustees' um, uh, oversight of uh, tuition and fees and of everything the university does. So that's called autonomy of governance. They are our governing board. We, we have a land grant mission. We have for over 140 years as a university. What does that mean? That means that everything that we discover here in the way of new knowledge, we try to take out to the rest of Indiana and so that it can benefit humankind in whatever ways, whether it's agriculture or engineering or the arts and humanities. And we like to think of Purdue, because it is a national university, actually it's a global university, as taking that land grant mission to become a world grant uh, mission. And that's why we talk a lot about global engagement. We have a new Global Policy Research Institute. We talk about experiences for students abroad. We bring in a lot of students from abroad because we want to think of Purdue as being a university really for the whole country, the whole world, and the benefits flowing in both directions. So those are our goals in working out what we think the budget should be in order to realize those goals. And the outcome has to be ultimately that we want to posi position Purdue to be higher in quality, higher in reputation, and higher in impact. And you will be the beneficiaries of that, and hopefully one day you will also contribute to fostering <laughs> that. So, so what have I asked the whole campus to do? Well, in my State of the University address in January, I pointed out these long-term tre trends, and that we have to think of our budget, which is think of it in terms of capacity for investment. We have to think of that not in two-year intervals, get all worked up every couple of years and fight like heck you know, to, uh, to sustain it. Um, but we have to, to look at it in, in tenure, uh, rolling tenure intervals, that, that looking ahead, and doing some strategic investments and some experiments here and there in learning and research and engagement. How are we going to bring in more revenue to the university so it can realize all those goals that I just listed? So I have everybody challenged, whether they're dining and food services or athletics or research or philanthropy. Um, Every, every unit is challenged with looking at itself not as a cost center that takes in money, but as a revenue center that produces money. How are they all going to double the revenues that they already have over the next seven to 10 years and thereby bring in more money, especially for the endowment, which we hope to really build up from our $1.6 billion to several billion dollars so we can fund more scholarships, more programs for students, more faculty endowed positions to keep our best faculty and recruit uh, excellent faculty to come to Purdue in the future. So this is what the course that we've set ourselves on. We're hoping by the middle of August to have a plan in front of the trustees that um, where all the different units have engaged in strategically planning for generating revenue over the next 10 years. And then we will be using it to, to make investments to realize those goals. So I hope that gives you some idea of the general, without going into too much detail, of the general direction, uh, kind of a summary of where the budget is and what we use it for uh, to, to uh, fund all these things we do and where we're headed in a long range sense. And now I, I think we, we have just lots of times for your particular questions. We have a lot of backup slides and information if you ask different sorts of questions to share with you. But we're interested in hearing from you. You've all come here with something on your mind. So let's get started. Thank you very much for your attention to this introduction. So as the president said, we will enter the, the portion of the night where we rely on you to um, participate. So uh, what I would ask is that if you have a question, just kind of signal me and I'll, I'll come to you. Um, why don't you, just for the sake of all of us having an idea of who's here, 
um, maybe say your name um, and where you're from in terms of this university and maybe where you're from in terms of the U.S. so we can know whether you're in state or out of state. Here's a question. Yeah. Good evening. How are you? Uh, Christopher Kalasha from Political Science Graduate Student. I'm out of state. I'm from Michigan. Got my undergrad at Michigan State. Um, there's been a lot of concern of recent for TAs and RAs. Uh, we realize that the state budget is the way that it is, and that appropriations are in the state that they are. Uh, but I was wondering if you had any comments or you could give us any indication about what's going to happen with the number of RAs and TAs across the departments. All right. Do we get that on? Yep. It's on. Okay. So I'm going to bring up our provost to is prepared to answer that question. So Tim Sands. Yeah, that um, the RA and TA budgets are, are not controlled centrally. So the uh, RA budget is a result of primarily of the uh, money that we bring in from research awards, which are at a record high. We're at $418 million for the West Lafayette campus this year. 28% uh, increase over last year. The TA budget issue is also uh, locally controlled. That's something that your college would control. Uh, that said, uh, we have challenged the, uh, each college to participate in our plan to um, save the $67 million that you saw from Treasurer Diaz slide. And uh, they'll be contributing, we guess, somewhere around 20 million. That was our, our charge to them. So they've put together plans for the next biennium and they're just plans at this point. So it's really premature for, for anyone at this point, including the deans, to um, comment on what the impact might be. But we're very concerned about it, um, and that's why we have to look carefully at all aspects of the budget to make sure that uh, we don't end up uh, sacrificing the quality of the, the delivery of instruction and teaching and learning mission of the university. So it's, it's a little bit, I'm, I'm, it may sound like I'm dancing around your question, but I don't really know. It's something that we're really concerned with and the deans are, are working on those budgets right now. Thank you. Good, e good evening, President Cordova. My name is Jackson Troxel um, from the College of Ag in northwestern Indiana, small town of La Crosse. My question to you is, what ideas do you have to grow that 10% sector of the other um, for funding of Purdue University? Right. Oh, thank you. My, my slide had some, uh, some ideas on it. Well, one um, kind of simple, obvious one is philanthropy, okay, that we, we now, um, we, a few years ago, we had a campaign for Purdue. It uh, produced capacity in Discovery Park to grow Discovery Park. Uh, new faculty positions, about uh, 300 of those, and uh, and some other things. Where we um, we, we didn't in increase the investment very much was in scholarships. That was one area which is very relevant to the student experience. And so I actually have used money because I realized that we just weren't competitive when I came here a few years ago with our peer institutions in the scholarship regime. So we we taken money out of the general funds to supplement the scholarship money that we have in philanthropy. And we simply have to raise the philanthropic dollars that's get our donors to want to give to scholarships and put a lot of it in the endowment. Because see, the difference between an endowment and spending the money right now is think of it as a bank account. You're, you're putting it in there where you just spend the interest and save the principal. So it pays for all time into the future. And we haven't had a focus on increasing the endowment. And we haven't had a focus on the item called scholarships. So, so now we do. We spend a lot more money now, something like, what, $40 million more out of the general fund than we did uh, this over the past couple of years. And, uh, you know, I hope to, to really grow it. So I've challenged the uh, development, that's what it's called, the group that raises money from gifts, philanthropy, to raise our $200 million a year annual level from alumni and friends to $400 million a year. That's their goal over the next seven, 
to 10 years. And they actually have a plan to do it. They brought in a consultant. They reviewed our database of alumni and their potential. And they think we can do it. What we really need to do is, is make sure we make the arguments in front of them that this is a big need, that maybe we don't so much need a, a building, but we need the money for scholarships, we need it for student success programs, uh, changes up in the classroom, whether they're IT changes and all that. So it's kind of a culture change, but it's also a fundraising change. And so we have a campaign uh, that is being planned in a quiet phase. You'll hear a lot more about it over the next few months. That's one way. But also increasing other budgets. Um, athletics has some potential upside with the expansion of teams. We just included Nebraska. We'll get some more money from that. We have, as Big Ten network contracts and all, people, there seems to be no limit to what people will pay to, to watch athletics. And so we, we Morgan Burke, the athletics director, is planning a, a, a plan for what needs to be reinvested in athletics and what he can return. For example, he has offered to return $12 million over six years that will be accumulated by the, uh, the expansion with uh, Nebraska and turn it over into to uh, a center for student excellence and leadership for students. And so that's the kind of thinking we're going to get everybody to, to do. Housing and dining is now giving a million dollars uh, a year to scholarships from the money that they raise. So when you eat your next meal and the dining courts, you can think you're helping somebody's scholarship to get raised. So we've got a lot of ideas. And that's why I've, ch I've challenged everybody with thinking of some more revenue opportunities. IT represents a huge opportunity as well. We've got a couple questions. Um, we're having okay. a technical difficulty. OK. This is not so. working. Or? No. Yeah. Um, and then so if you could maybe just repeat whatever question okay. is asked repeat so that it, okay. um, go ahead. I'm Nathan Murphy. I'm with uh, Crane. I'm a double major in engineering economics. Uh, and I'm also in Indiana State. Right. My, my question is just with the buildings that we have. Tom mentioned that there were uh, a time when we were trying to make some investments. Is there any plan or Yes, and this is a great time to bring up Ken Sandal, who's the head of all that. <laughs> well, we continually evaluate what the needs are, and you're exactly right. There's a number of new facilities going, going up. Uh, when we approach uh, the looking at whether we build new or we, we renovate, we look at are we filling a gap or are we, we looking at what's obsolete that we need to to look at. So Al mentioned that we had just done a, a, a pretty extensive review of our facilities and what that did was point to what our priorities need to be. We have, and Al showed on the slide, uh, about a $30 million need uh, on an annual basis and that's what would keep the deferred problem from growing. When we have about $10 million, uh, it, that's what we fund currently without any state support. That really allows us to really take care of what is our safety needs and the building envelopes, the roofs, the, the um, masonry, the structure, uh, the windows, the doors, and so forth. That's the level at which we can invest, and we invest all across campus to take care of the safety and those type of needs. Uh, we are looking right now at how do we work with the state to fund that additional amount of R&R &R that would allow us to then touch the same things that you see the most, the interiors, uh, the climate that's in the buildings, the, the HVAC units, and, and so forth, the mechanical, the electrical systems. That's what the next wave of funding would allow us to do. We invest all across campus in all of our facilities, because as Al mentioned, there's about $4.4 .4 billion of replacement value, so we have a large plant. After that, the next funding goes to laboratories and classrooms. And that's when we can, that's where, what you would see, see the most and bring those up to current standards. I guess, does that address your question? Was, was Nathan, um, were you asking about new, new buildings as well? Yeah, I was gonna yeah. Say, are there any yeah. new buildings? Sure, about the student success corridor and, yeah, and the Yeah, there's two main focus right, right now. There's the, 
the Life and Health Science Quad. Um, so when you think of Lily Hall uh, in, in that particular quad, there's part of that building that we've renovated and part of the building that we're going to tear down and replace. So in the Life and Health Science Quad, that area, there's a Health and Human Science building, there's a Drug Discovery building. We've asked the state for an Animal Science building. Um, and so uh, there's also a focus on the Student Success Corridor. Dr. Cordova mentioned the uh, CCEL, uh, uh, or the uh, Center for Student Excellence and Leadership. Uh, that's a facility that we are planning that's going to be right in the front door of the, the COREC, right, right along 3rd Street. Uh, so there's that facility. There's also some, some other facilities that are planned along there for student projects, facilities, and so forth. So a lot of investment along that. And the renovation of the COREC uh, is a very large investment there. A lot, lot of the building uh, work is uh, paid for by, through private contributions, okay? And this, so the state, like take the new health uh, and human sciences facility, which is like number one on our list for the state. This, we're asking the state for only $16 million for that, but the building costs $54 million. So all the rest of the money is coming from other sources, a combination of sources. Right. Yeah, like Lily, a, a portion, part of Lily Hall. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that that would be a good example. I think on that one, it's mostly from the state, and it's number one on the cap, the ten-year capital plan, the animal sciences That's building. Right. Yep. For, from the previous plan for for last year. Twenty million in gifts, Ken says. Yeah. Yeah, we have. Do do we have? A kind of our building plan on the website too on the budget link we, we could do that if the students are interested in seeing what's good you know the student success corridor what's going to be torn down what's going to be built up what the priority is we, we'd be happy to put something together so that you can you can sit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay we'll put that as an action uh, Brad you have to call him <laughs> I don't want to choose <laughs> Hi, good evening, um, President. My name, my name is Luo Qi, and uh, my major is mecha mechanical engineering. I'm from China, and I'm now president of Purdue Chinese Student and Scholar Association. My question is, uh, in, uh, speaking of the scholarship, I, I noticed that a lot of scholarships are only open for domestic students. I mean, US citizens or uh, permanent, permanent, permanent residents. So, but Purdue has 40% of international students, I guess. Well, not, not 40%, about yeah. 10, 11%. Oh, graduate students, I'm sorry. Yes. No, international students, yeah, yeah, I mean. Yeah. yeah, but the scholarship, okay. scholar chances. Right. OK, so let me answer that. Um, the the portion of the scholarship funding, remember I said that a lot of it comes out of the general fund? That's state money, and so we really can't use that to fund international students. We made that agreement in order to do this, all right? So, so we are committed to raising money uh, from private sources for the international students, including our international alumni. So I go to China twice a year. I'm going in April. And I lose no opportunity to meet with parents and alumni and, uh, and tell them that, uh, that students have scholarship needs and we love the students from their country, from China, and, um, and ask them to think about 
giving to a, a scholarship fund. But a as you know much better than I, this is the whole idea of fundraising for higher education for scholarships is is new kind of thinking. There's not the long history that there is in this country, especially at private institutions in this country, of raising money for scholarships. So we're working on it, but we just can't use the state funds for international students, and that's where we have a majority of funds, including a lot of federal scholarship funds like Pell Grant funds, the SASE funds, which are an independent source from the state, and our own general funds. So that's, that's the problem we have, but we, we understand your situation. Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sequoia Murray. I'm uh, in the School of Chemical Engineering. I'm from Northern Indiana, so I'm in state. Um, my question is kind of an extension off the buildings. Um, I live in Brownstone, which is uh, PRF is my leasing office. And I noticed that when I re-signed my lease, there's a paragraph in there that was highlighted, that was never highlighted before, that I had to initial by that said that Purdue can choose to take this land at any time throughout the year, and I have 30 days to move out. And so I'm. I think it's only 28 now. So <laughs> I'm, just I'm wondering. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I I just couldn't resist it. <laughs> I'm just wondering if that's something that would happen in the middle of October, right. where I'm in sure. midterm. Uh, I'm going to let Ken answer that because I, I I think I know why it's happening. That specifically relates to uh, some of the uh, development that we are doing along uh, the Third Street corridor. The, the brownstones you're talking about are right on Russell, Third, yeah. th third and Russell. Yeah. Um, there will be more lead time than that. They they have to do that contractually, uh, just to because there's that clause in there, and they're at least highlighting it for you. One of the thoughts were that as we look at a C cell, uh, Center for Student Excellence and Leadership Development, there and a little bit of growth in, in maybe some student housing there. What could they utilize that the PRF property for to complement that, uh, that would enhance that student's student corridor that we're calling the student success corridor? So we have indicated as a university to PRF that that, that would be, that's a target area. So they're looking at what type, type of development that they could do. These things have a long, long time. They, we plan them, it takes years to do some of that, but they have to position themselves so that they're fair to the people living there, that if something were to move quicker, they're at least notifying you. But we know that's a few years out, uh, but uh, usually they'll let it go through the, through the, the contract period, and then they won't re renew, and then they'll take care of. So I think it's just they're cautious. But the, p the plan is that there are certain areas on campus that are older that would be better to, you know, going back to Nathan's question, to take them down and build a newer facility. So that is an area. The reason you see that clause is it, it is an area earmarked for eventually coming down. So you shouldn't plan to be 50 years old and still living there. Uh, <laughs> but, but we also will, you know, I think, Ken is saying that we will re respect that, you know, that students need some time to move and it's not going to be 30 days, okay, either. So, it, I mean, usually it does take, you know, a, a two or three years uh, in order to, so you, you'd be notified that in a, you know, there's a plan and in a couple of years this is what the plan looks like, okay, so don't lose any sleep over that, please. I, so this hand was Hi, I'm Andrew Martin from Decatur, Illinois, and I'm going into civil and environmental engineering. I know that as part of the Student Success Corridor, HPN and ENAD are slated for destruction. Is there any way to save them, perhaps as a student organization? Ken? <laughs> You're up. <laughs> the what, when we look at the whole uh, student success corridor, one of the things that we've begun talking about uh, is that section of campus by ENAD and, and the HPN is the, uh, I assume it's the North Power Plant is what you're, what you're talking about. Um, 
we have looked at those. The, the saving of the power plant is not possible. The boilers that are inside are connected to the outer structure. So if we were to do anything to remove the, the, the guts of the building, the entire sides just collapse in. The, this, the insides are connected to the structure of the facility. So the north power plant is impossible to save. It's also very expensive to take down. Um, ENAD is one of those things that that is a prime area for development. And one of the things that we're considering is library classroom type of, of options, things that would directly impact the students. We always investigate what the options are to save any facility, to reuse. Uh, the sustainability aspects are always something that is considered. Um, and we always take those things into account. That is a longer range plan. So you will see a lot of development along Third Street before you will see any development uh, at that particular location. I, I think you can tell by now that Ken is, um, he's really our capital um, projects fellow. And so if, if you have any um, questions, you can just email Ken Sandel, S-A-N-D-E-L, <laughs> and he can, I mean, he can still answer them tonight, but I mean, in the future, if you're worried, if you're worried. Um, he is very busy making plans for what, you know, we have a master plan for the campus, and I think that's online somewhere but it, on the website. And, and so you can, you can look at that, and you can see what the idea is. We have a campus that's a little bit different than some others. Instead of spreading everything out for 10 miles, we want kind of a dense core so that you have easy walking distance between your buildings and where you work out and where you dine and where you sleep. And and so it'll look like a dancer community with a big green belt around it. But we also have a road plan to, you know, get more cars off the roads and have bicycle paths. None of these things happen overnight. But it's good to, you know, if you're sensitive to your environment and you want to find out what's happening, there are ways, uh, there are definitely ways to do that. But we, we hope that whatever we do, the physical plant is an improvement rather than, you know, than taking, taking something away. Okay, so you can get involved. I know some of you are on planning groups like for these different student centers. I know Brad is very, very involved in helping to plan uh, facilities. So others of you who are interested can offer to do that. Uh, I'm Nathan Fuller. I'm a chemical engineer, but I'm also primarily involved in Army ROTC here. And so I'm wondering if there's any particular considerations at this point for the Armory, because the Armory, if you've been inside recently, it has multiple issues. Um, we have recently had to have Navy Army ROTC to stop doing PT because of lead issues on the floor. So I just didn't know if there was any primary considerations for revitalizing the Armory. Yeah, sorry about that. I can honestly say it, it's on the list and the issues that you see inside of that facility and, and with that facility are part of the deferred problem. Um, uh, so we look at what can we afford to do and how does it address so the safety and structures to keep, we're gonna, what we're doing right now is we're keeping the weather out and uh, we need more resources in order to you know, get in and invest in the, the interiors and to upgrade that facility. And, and the resources just aren't presently there. So we know all about those concerns and it, it's one of the, the, the facilities that it's identified. It's on our list of deferred situations. We just need the funding in order to address it. Uh, if something breaks, we, we will get in and fix it. If the leak occurs, not to go out and start a leak or anything. <laughs> uh, but. Uh. Another example is Elliot. You'll see just today a fence is all around Elliot because we've had leaking roofs, we've had little fires, we've had sm you know, s the smoke the other night. Um, and, uh, and of course, Elliot is used a lot by students to take their exams and to enjoy concerts and the like and commencement and everything. And so we're just taking some precious resources and we just 
said it's urgent. We'd love to do a total renovation. It cost a fortune of Elliott. We can't, but we are spending a few million dollars just trying to hit some very important safety issues. But all of these things that you're mentioning are part of what's called R&R, &R, and and that's really stressed. We used to get more money from the state to do that, and we are just getting less and less money. And so that's part of why we're anxious about, uh, about our funding situation, is that r and is one of the most heavily impacted areas. There's other things like, uh, you know, the PMO people were doing their rehearsals in Elliott. We decided it was not a good situation for them. And so Mr. Bailey and his wife stepped up and gave us $8 million for a new facility for them. So that's another solution that is helping in some places to address the r, &R problem when our wonderful alumni. So on the armory, it'd, it'd just be great if we, you know, you students had a group of alumni that you could, were just passionate about the programs there, because. Uh, we completely agree it could use some attention and they could come forward and you know raise some money to uh, to fix it that gets it moved up in the queue for sure uh, I, I have a question uh, we, we offered the opportunity to submit questions anonymously and online for those who couldn't be there and I thought this would be a good one that would interest everyone um, the question is that um, so if we if we allow ourselves to assume that there will be a decrease in state funding um, and if we hypothetically couldn't raise tuition or fees, um, what would we lose? Or what would the impacts to campus be? Well, I, I th uh, I'm going to turn it over to, to Provost Sands about a lot of the, um, the papers, the thinking on this came out of the colleges. And just with the charge that we gave them for looking at 3% cuts for each of the next two years, what would be the impact of those? We, we saw, we saw the, the beginning of what would happen there. And one thing is you're coming up, Tim, to kind of carry on the conversation. One impact I'll point out, we, we've already suffered this past year, which is instead of, uh, usually we hire about 130 professors a year. And this just directly matches the, the turnover rate of professors, either retiring or going elsewhere. And you know that's all about keeping our faculty-student ratio at a good rate and making sure we have classroom sizes that are not too big and you have the mentors that you need. Well, this past year, we hired only 49. So that was one-third of the usual uh, number. And the deans tell us if, if we keep that up, then you know our rankings will go down. We'll have less professors, bigger classroom sizes, and all. So it's it's not a good situation. Yeah, I think if, if that were to come to pass, then um, uh, it certainly would uh, impact uh, the the programs that we're allowed or able to offer the diversity of the programs. Because the number one consideration is to keep the value of of your degree as high as possible and not to let that deteriorate. But I think if, if we were constrained to that degree, um, it would impact, at least in the short term, class sizes. It would uh, limit, as you said, uh, the hiring of faculty. We would have to shrink the number of faculty. There's, there's probably, and, and you can't do that quickly. Um, and we would be uh, looking seriously at, at programs that might have to be um, terminated in the long run. Of course, that process is a very long process. It's not something you can do overnight. Uh, certainly looking at uh, duplication and becoming more efficient, but we think we've been through already an exercise that has identified about as much as we can do without uh, getting down into the meat and the bones, so to speak. So it, it would be a difficult, um, a difficult situation. You look anxious. Well, so, so yeah, we've talked about doing more with less, and obviously reduction of redundancy is the easiest way to do that. And you say you looked at everything. Um, currently, computer science and computer engineering have a 90% overlap in the research areas of the faculty there. We teach a number of the same classes. A proposal that I know all of you have mm -hmm. seen has been put forth uh, actually since, I guess, 2008. Um, merging those two and reducing that redundancy would save three to four million annually once the merger is done. That is money that could be used for a lot of other programs or may mm -hmm. not, you know, have to be cut from other programs. I have yet to hear any uh, any reasons against this uh, 
why this uh, proposal keeps getting tabled that don't have to deal with politics, fiefdoms and deans and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I mean, here we're interested in the academics, mm -hmm. and that actually makes a stronger department, and it saves us all money. And I'm really curious, are there any academic or financial reasons that that proposal keeps getting tabled? Well, it, it really um, hasn't been tabled in the sense of, uh, we haven't given up on it. Um, I became provost 11 months ago, and uh, that was one of the first things that hit my desk. And we've been engaged in continuous discussions. As you know, the former uh, head of uh, computer science uh, has a blog. So if you want to go read, you can read about what I told him, what he's heard from the deans. We had an open forum with the uh, computer science faculty where Dean Jameson, Dean of Engineering, and uh, Dean Roberts, Dean of Science, addressed the entire faculty of computer science. Uh, it was an interesting discussion. There's a lot of strong feelings on, on both sides. Uh, and those are the kind of discussions that would have to continue and will continue at some level. We're not gonna table those things. The problem we have right now is that uh, in that particular case, and I'm still learning about it. Matter of fact, computer science is going through an external review coming up in the next week. Yeah. yeah. So um, we weren't gonna do anything before that. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, as far as what we might do in the future, it will depend a little bit on what we learn from that external review. Uh, but um, it, it also, we have to take into account um, the views not just from computer science, but also from computer or electrical and computer engineering. There is not unanimity there. In fact, there are very strong feelings that what you, s what you just said is not right. But there are other views that yes, there is overlap. Um, the, the key feature, though, that I'm going to be looking for is provost, and this is a little bit difficult because the deans all report to me, and that's why it really does fall into the lap of the provost. Um, the deans themselves, although I have to tell you they're very collaborative, um, a great group of people, they work together extremely well, but um, there are some things that do fall on into the provost's office just because I am responsible for the academic program overall. So the thing that I will be looking for primarily is what is in the best interest of the students. Now the faculty, uh, of course we're concerned with what's in the best interest of the faculty, but the faculty don't have the, the, the boundaries that the students <coughs> often see. And we do have administrative boundaries, but you know, how would we save money in terms of the faculty? Well, we'd have to reduce the total number of faculty. And that's the kind of consolidation we would get where we would save money. Uh, but if you look at what the faculty do, they uh, may work in similar areas. They actually collaborate. If a lot of the computer science faculty have joint appointments in electrical and computer engineering. So I think they would argue that that's not the, the way to save money there. So I look at academic reorganization as um, you know potential for saving money, but really the reason to do it is to better the options for the students and to give them uh, more flexibility and, and a higher value of their degree. And that doesn't necessarily save money. So I, I would argue that um, uh, one has to do a careful analysis there, that the reason you do programmatic review and uh, restructuring isn't to save money. You do it to make the university better. And I would give an example of one that was very bold that started before I became provost, and that was uh, uh, the <coughs> creation of the College of Health and Human Sciences, which took nine departments and schools from three different colleges and put them together into one new college. And that was not without pain, but the nine units that went together all decided as units that they wanted to join because they saw the synergies that could come from that. And that's the, the kind of environment you want when you do an academic reorganization. You want all the units to recognize that this is something that is in their benefit. They may not see it right away, and I don't know, since I wasn't involved in, um, President Cordova lived through that and knows, knows the history of it, uh, and it was a former provost of Woodson that was um, coordinated the, the reorganization. So we know how to do those things. I would, I would argue that was a tougher one than, than the computer science ECE issue. Um, and the other thing that I would argue about that particular one is that it's much, it goes much beyond uh, uh, computer science and ECE. We've got uh, computer or information technology related departments in the College of Technology. We've got them spread. I, there's something like that in virtually every, every college. And to do that whole thing right, I think we have to look at the, the whole picture. Uh, but you raise a great point, and it's not an easy issue, and we're going to be on it. But I don't think it's going to save money in the short run. It may not even save money in the long run, but it could make us better if we do it right.
It is. One, oh, go ahead. One Sorry. thing, just right now, you should be very proud that both units are just spurred. I mean, I, you know, the computer science department has some of the world experts in it, and of course, getting that big twenty-five million dollar grant on the science of information, you know, fabulous. And BC, mm -hmm. of course, is one of our premier departments, mm -hmm. exception in the top few in the country. And so it is an evolving thing, but we understand and we're looking forward to this external review too. There's nothing like a little external light shed on something that brings out uh, you know, mm -hmm. new thinking. Mm -hmm. so thank you for your question. It's important in the overall context of academic program reviews and the mm -hmm. provost is leading that university-wide because the trustees are also very interested in the, the big question that you asked which is, are there efficiencies and improvements to be realized in looking at all the academic programs of the university? So, let's do that. Hi, I'm Nikki Ritchie. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering. And uh, my question is about the engineering differential fees. Um, now, I'm a grad student. I have a, a research assistantship. and. Although my tuition and part of my fees are remiss, the other part are not, including the engineering differential fees. So just to give a perspective, I give almost two of my paychecks back to Purdue to pay for fees. And I'm just curious, what do those fees do for me, since I'm giving back two of my paychecks? Okay, that's a fair question. And uh, again, Tim, I'd like you to address the, the differential fee. But I will, it is good to remind uh, the graduate students, especially those who are new, that two years ago we had a situation if you have a special graduate fee, and then we made the commitment uh, when I came here mm -hmm. to take that fee down to zero over four years. And so we're right at year two of that. And so that fee is being reduced. So we, we are sensitive to the <coughs> issues that graduate students uh, face. Well, I, c I can add a l uh, 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 maybe a little bit more to that. It, we recognize that issue, and um, uh, we're in the process of looking at all those differential fees uh, more carefully. And the one thing that we, um, we're looking at is, does it make sense to charge the same differential fee for graduate students as it does undergrads? It could be larger, it could be smaller, but does it make, does it make sense to have it tied together? Because the, uh, the benefits are, are different. I mean, one of the benefits, uh, the, the differential fee, by the way, does go back to the college, which is something that, uh, f at least for the undergraduate portion, I'm not sure about the, how that works with the graduate. Same thing. So all the differential fee, unlike the, um, the tuition, uh, which comes back to the general fund and then is redistributed out to the colleges, a good portion of the differential fee that you pay does go back to the college, and they, they have a plan for how they spend it. I, to be honest, I don't know the details of the engineering differential fee plan, but they spend it on uh, priorities for engineering. So it does go back directly. It could be uh, faculty salaries, for example. Uh, that's something that I believe uh, the differential fee pays for in engineering. It could be uh, expanded or better laboratories. Uh, so, um, I don't have the details, but if you email me, I can look into that. Well, can I ask a follow-up real quick? Mm -hmm. um, other schools, uh, if you can, in combination, um, your students don't actually have an engineering differential fee, and Purdue is much higher than some of these others, and many of those schools have been raised with you, so you're actually in tuition for that. So, I'm kind of curious, why does Purdue do that? I, mm -hmm. you know, the question is, why don't we waive the, the, uh, the differential fee for graduate students? Um, I don't know. I will look into that and try and understand that better. I can say that um, compared to our peers, we mainly look at Illinois and Michigan because they're both highly ranked engineering schools. Our uh, tuition fees are quite a bit lower than Illinois and Michigan, considerably lower, even in engineering. So um, I think, uh, but your question's a little different. It has to do with remission. So that's, I, We'll look into that. It's quarter after. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so it has to do with the fees. Um, I, someone told me that a couple of years ago, Purdue would allow professors to pay for those fees um, from their grants, and that this was limited because not every grant was allowed to pay for those fees. Um, is it a possibility to maybe make that look that complicated that if a professor has a fund, they're willing to pay those fees? Would you like them to do that? This might be a gym. Yeah, I think that's before my time, so we'll bring up Jim Allman. Yeah. I'm not sure uh, exactly what the circumstances are there, but when a graduate student 
uh, participates in a research project, uh, then there's typically a, a fee remit charge that is uh, assessed to the to the uh, research project. And um, uh, I, I'm just not knowing the particular situation. So, and that's pretty standard on, on the research uh, projects that are uh, funded externally. It's quarter after eight, um, so we will just we'll, we'll take a, a couple last questions. I know this gentleman in the back has had his hand up yeah. since the beginning. Um, and did you want? Did you have a follow up question? Oh, okay. <laughs> a brand new one. Okay. Let me just say on some of the graduate student questions in particular, we have a wonderful dean of the graduate uh, school, Mark Smith, used to be an ECE, well, still is an ECE professor, and um, and you you can make a, a lot of progress by bringing him particular issues and having him do the first triage on some of those issues because he meets regularly with the provost and with me, and um, that's the only way, as your student leaders will tell you, to make a lot of progress on these issues that might be buried pretty deep within budgets and what one uh, faculty does but another faculty in different college doesn't do or doesn't feel they have the, uh, the right to. So, so please you know, continue to work with Mark Smith, with Dean Smith, and with Andy here on some of these. I can add a quick comment that um, we are working closely with uh, the Dean of Engineering also, uh, Leah Jamison, and we've been meeting almost every day to talk about these very issues that you're raising uh, over the last week or so. So um, if you have issues like that, uh, talk to Dean Jamison as well because she's very sensitive to that. I know she has some focus groups that have uh, been dealing with these ex exact issues, and uh, we've been communicating almost daily on them. So we'll take the question in the back uh, first, and then we'll take your question, OK? Uh, I had a couple quick uh, questions and comments. Uh, my name is Paul McPherson. I'm a graduate student in the College of Technology. I'm from southern Ohio. I did my undergraduate at Berea College in Berea, Kentucky. They're known for one of the largest endowments uh, for, for private schools in the nation. Um, my first question is in regards to TA ships and RA ships um, in the fact that is there oversight over, we're, we're talking about the budget and how to reduce uh, the cost based on our budget, but are there any oversight over what professors do, um, how often they're in the classroom versus their TA? Um, uh, having been a TA for two and a half years, um, I know that I'm in the, in the classroom more than the professor. And I know that in the College of Technology, there are a lot of professors that see them that tend to use their TAs more than themselves to go to class. Now, some of these professors are making 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars a year. The students are paying to learn from the professors, not from the grad students. So my question is, is what kind of oversight uh, is there in how often the professors are in the classroom? And the second, the second question I have is in regards to the master plan for uh, construction. I know I saw on the website that the construction company that Purdue uses is out of, is out of Pennsylvania. Uh, has there been any consideration to use a local company and use the talent that you have and the students on Purdue's campus to rebuild and, and uh, um, restructure some of the buildings? I know at Berea, um, when they went to uh, develop a, a sustainability plan, they used a lot of the students on campus um, and hired the students uh, for 10 or 20 hours a week and the students were actually building new facilities and implementing new technologies into buildings. So uh, is there a sustainability plan for the campus? And has it been considered to use the talent that, that we so treasure here at Purdue uh, to assist in that, in that uh, venture? OK. So you had three questions, really. So I'll let Tim do the, uh, Sands do the oversight question. And then uh, Ken Sandel can do the contracting question of out of state versus in state. That's a very uh, simple uh, response. And then Al can do the sustainability question. In terms of the oversight, the, uh, the primary oversight is through the dean. The dean has uh, control to a large extent over the, the, the way that the faculty spend their time. Uh, so that's where it would start. Um, 
to be honest, I don't know um, exactly where we stand on that issue, except for that uh, I know that we've decreased the number of TAs uh, over the last, what, eight or nine years, ever since I've been here, uh, pretty steadily. So that brings the more faculty into the classroom, but there's a very wide range from college to college and program to program. So I would first ask you, um, and I'm not dumping this whole thing off on, on you, but uh, because I'll look into it as well, but I would first ask you to, uh, to have a chat with the department head and also the dean if, if that doesn't uh, satisfy your, your, uh, your interest. And we will be looking at that. We do actually, we're frankly, we're ranked based on things like that is how much time do the faculty spend in the class, how many classes are taught by, or how much time uh, instruction is, is directly with faculty, how small the classes are. So we do pay attention to it globally. Well, I can well, tell it's you. A, if you, your new dean of the College of Technology, can address with you, because no, we no, are. No, it is. It is an important point, and, and I think the um, uh, the uh, I think the uh, one thing you have to keep in mind too is, and I'm, this gets back to a question or a point that I was just making that the colleges have very different histories, and and uh, they they essentially, if you go back ten or twenty years, they operated almost independently. The College of Technology, you go back 10 years or so, uh, the main um, impetus or the main uh, focus of that college was undergraduate uh, teaching instruction, undergraduate degree production. It's in the midst of changing. They're bringing in a research program that's growing fairly steadily. Uh, they do more in engagement, they do more in commercialization. So it's a much different college than it was 10 years ago. And, and uh, so, I look at that compared to some other colleges where most of the attention goes to, uh, to research, uh, maybe degree production. Uh, some colleges like College of Liberal Arts and College of Science, uh, a lot of their effort goes into teaching foundation courses for other majors. So th there's uh, so much variability, it's hard for me to say anything generally. Okay. I'll let Ken answer the... I think there was about three questions buried in there, but uh, the first the first one uh, related to contracting. I know when when we have a construction company, we are subject to public works. We publicly bid those whoever is the lowest and best bid. We don't really differentiate on the best side. It's the lowest lowest bid unless there's some reason that would cause us to reject. We go with the lowest bid. Uh, so who we hire on a contractor a contractor side of things is not up to us. It, we're, we're, we have to hire whoever the low, lowest bid is. On the architects and engineering side of things, which is kind of to your point on the master plan, um, in that specifically on the master plan, we partnered an East Coast firm who was very experienced with campus master plans primarily around the areas of students and student programming and so forth. So we paired them with Scholar, uh, which is a local firm who had had a lot of experience uh, with uh, architect uh, architectural drawings and so forth and, and the buildup of our, our master plans over time. So that was purposeful in that we wanted to, to get additional uh, insight but pair it up with somebody who's very familiar w with us and so uh, I think it's Sasaki who you may uh, I assume you were looking at the master plan but that that's who it was paired with Scholar locally um, the other thing your last point was taking advantage of the talent we have at Purdue uh, we have done some of that I'll admit we haven't done as much of that as we probably should. Mackey Arena is probably a great example of that in that Mackey was a project that a student group did take on and for what was designed originally as a, a or conceived as a separate facility and tearing down Mackey was actually as a result of several student groups uh, uh, actually uh, got them on the path right where they are of, of saving the bowl and uh, expanding at that current site, which just renewed that location for years to come. So, but I, I'll agree, we probably could do a little bit more of reaching out to the various uh, groups here at Purdue. 
uh, Ken didn't mention it, but uh, during the course of this activity with uh, uh, sustaining new synergies, uh, uh, he did employ, I think it was six graduate students, for, it was eight graduate students from uh, Cranert, in fact, to uh, uh, do some research and help with identifying, do benchmarking and help with identifying uh, 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 approaches for more efficiencies. Um, uh, it, with regard to having uh, fac uh, excuse me, students actively involved in uh, 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 performing these projects, we, we, we've seen some evidence and supported some things uh, that were experimental in nature in that regard. Uh, but in terms of uh, any operational activities, we haven't, uh, haven't really pursued that. But frankly, I think through physical facilities, uh, uh, we may want to do that in the future. So I'll, I'll talk to uh, Vice President McMains about uh, em employing more students in uh, active roles in uh, facilities, largely uh, associated with sustainability, which is, I think, a, an area where there's some energy that comes from the student body. So, yeah. Uh, I know at Berea, when Berea um, announced their sustainability plan, right. uh, that was a way for them to greatly increase the donations from their alumni, because that, that was a, a big thing, and it's an even bigger thing now. So um, that, that's why I was asking about the sustainability plan, because that may be a way to generate more income and partnerships with large corporations yeah, yeah, and I think I, I, uh, uh, President uh, Cordova was just reminding me that uh, uh, we we have seen evidence of that already. The the Gatewood building was donated, uh, or the donation that we got specifically was tied to making that building a lead uh, uh, building, and uh, and so I, you're you're absolutely right. I think that there are are uh, alumni out there that would uh, want to participate in some way. Uh, uh, in in the sustainability activity. I think one of the things that we're trying to uh, concentrate on uh, more in the future is more active uh, uh, faculty involvement, and I think that'll give us a better connection to students. Thank you. All right, I'm Clarence Ponsler. I came from Mossell, Indiana, which is in-state, of course, and I'm an Earth and Atmospheric Sciences major. I want to talk about the Makers All campaign. I have a question about that. Is the Makers All campaign a good idea to use part of your biannual budget plan? And where and where and what resources did you use to spend on this program? Great question, Clarence. Let me, w I just happened to notice in the back of the room our Vice President for Marketing Media, and she's in charge of Makers All. She's a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, that's a setup, isn't it? Uh, the funds that are used for the Makers All campaign and all the marketing we do here um, is from the operating budget, from our general fund, and every year a percentage of that general fund is allocated to marketing activity. It's an eensy eensy bit. Um, it's about $750,000. Um, some of you who know my story know that I came from the corporate world, and I run, ran budgets in excess of $100 million just for marketing, not for the company overall. So when we're talking about what to do with $750,000, we have to be extremely creative in getting out our message. Um, so both the Reflections campaign, which was the campaign that we ran prior to Makers All, and Makers All draws from the same bucket of funds. It's strictly from my marketing budget, and then what I have to do is make decisions about if we spend here, what do we not spend on? Did that cover all of it? I think. Okay, are you an idea maker? talk about a couple of the you know of very significant national awards that you've gotten for this make us all campaign because in the branding world you know there are brands that really tank changes in brands you know and you could mention a couple examples of those and there are like Dartmouth had a D plus campaign Drake <laughs> Drake <laughs> Drake Drake yeah Drake, sorry D plus but anyway you might yeah. have to say a couple of Thank you. Um, we've actually done extremely well with the Makers All campaign. Just last weekend, uh, we won three Addies, which are ad 
advertising awards uh, called Addies, three Addies locally, and then our ad agency, Ology, which assists us in building out the campaign, submitted, we can't submit the same materials to different competitions. So they submitted some of the materials and we submitted some. They actually won five. What's interesting is that they're building out their business development brochure based strictly on Purdue's Makers All campaign. So that means it's a glossy magazine, about 15 pages, and they're mailing it out to prospective clients to say, hey, look at the cool work we did at Purdue, look at the results that we were able to get here, and try to use that to drive business with other colleges. We've also got a lot of recognition from uh, a group called the EMG, Educational Marketing Group. They award every year what's called an International Brand Master. They selected seven colleges uh, to be semi-finalists in this and then reduced the pool down to, to three finalists. And we were in the final three. We actually ended up getting second for that. And again, it's based not only on Makers All, but really on a lot of the other marketing programs that we've been running here. So. Could you say a couple of words about why we do marketing and how the brand affects our reputational ranking and our recognition nationally? Sure. So uh, a, a key piece of telling our story is really making sure that uh, people understand what's the value proposition of Purdue. I like to use the phrase, what is it that makes Purdue better, different, special? Because if we don't stand for something that differentiates us from other, every other college out there, suddenly your degree is not worth the same amount or it has the same value of that of any other institution. So we're constantly figuring out what are those stories that we can tell? What are those messages that we can deliver about student success, about faculty research, about commercialization, discovery, innovation that happens here that will help build that national reputation and that national energy around this is an institution that really is better, different, special from all those other places. And part of telling that story is making sure that prospective students understand that. So you, you think back to when you were coming to, to college as, as freshmen, as undergraduates, or those of you who are graduate students and deciding to come here. You were inundated with all sorts of literature, right? We want to make sure that that literature that you're looking at tells the story about Purdue in the most compelling way possible so that we, we win your vote, right? If you're the student that we want here, we want you to come to the dance with us. Yeah. You have good judgment. <laughs> what is the uh, possible financial benefits of it? Is there any way that it, it would bring in additional revenue uh, besides just additional student tuition? Okay, great, great question. So the first point, what did we forego in in choosing Makers All? So in the in the branding world, what really happens? And I know it's late, and I'll, you'll get me going, and I won't shut up. But you essentially build a brand strategy. And in building that brand strategy, then you figure out what are the creative ways that I can deliver against that strategy. So when we did our research, the brand platform for Purdue is Catalyst for Transformation. Well, a lot of different schools can say that, right? Um, so we need to figure out what's a way that we can say that creatively that we feel is most resonant with the population that we're trying to reach at this point in time. We were presented by our agency, we usually farm that work out, and they come back with three different concepts. And we felt like this particular concept <coughs> was the clear winner. Um, I, I, at this point, don't even remember what the other two uh, competing concepts were, but in our professional judgment as marketers, we saw this as something that was clearly differentiating. One of the things I really like about Makers All, and I know there was controversy, are you doing with Boilermakers? Just for the record, no, beep no, we're not doing away with boiler <laughs> That's sacred, we're keeping it. This is additive, not reductive, right? So, so we're just, what I love is that nobody else can play with that word make the way we can. What we do moves the world forward, makes a difference. We own that word make. It's in our genes as boiler makers. Let's take it and play with that every which way we can. And I... <laughs> you didn't know they were saving the entertainment for the end, did you? <laughs> and I forgot the second part uh, of your what question. What financial benefits and what gains can we, do we, can we prospectively see in the future? Well, one is 
just building awareness and reputation, right? Um, the second is the more effective you're, so what the, our bottom line business is getting people in seats, right? Good people like you, gifted students like you, that's who we want here. So our goal is to figure out how can we get you here by spending the least amount of money to get you here. We've got to tell our story, right? Nobody just markets a product without putting out literature, putting out ads, using social media, whatever. Um, so our return is really figuring out through our direct mail, through our advertising, what is it that's getting people to respond that's hooking them to say, yeah, I want to look at you, and oh, by golly, I want to come visit, and then I want to come to school here. So we measure response rates, we measure um, return rates, we measure acceptance rates, and we're constantly tweaking our materials to figure out, is that material delivering the best return possible? So that's a literal financial interpretation of marketing. And of course, then there's the, there's the whole piece of just building the story and building the reputation, which is much more subjective to do because we want to get out impressions. The more eyeballs that see information about your institution, the more people understand it, the more people understand, the more likely you are to be in their consideration set or to be in their parents' consideration set they pass. So it's, it's getting the message out in a way that's compelling to increase those impressions as well. And it looks like Provost Stans wants to add to that. Yeah, maybe I could just add another dimension or two as a, as a researcher. Uh, um, when I was director of the Burke Nanotechnology Center um, the last few years, uh, one of the, the, what we wanted to be, and this is true for Purdue as a whole, is, is the most influential university or the most influential program across the country. And part of that is getting the word out there. And why do you want to be the most influential? Well, you want to be the first one that um, uh, the U.S. government or a company thinks about in terms of bringing into a project. Because that brings more revenue for research. That, that's something that's uh, really, really critical to a lot of what we do. So um, I've watched M&M, um, uh, &M, <laughs> Terry's operation, uh, change the way that we get our word out, on, especially with respect to research. When, when I first started as Burke director in 2006, we weren't getting anything out there. And uh, after a few years, um, we now saw placements. I don't know, what, how much has the placements gone up in the last couple of years? Um, just tremendously. I, I, I don't know the number, but. Well, <laughs> they've, got, they've gone up a lot, and uh, they went up from almost nothing, at least in my area, to, yeah. to very substantial, and that just directly feeds our, our reputation. It makes it easier to get research grants. It makes it easier to work with companies, and it's, it's global. It's not just, just national. One example, Clarence, you said you were in Earth and Space Science? Earth and Atmospheric, atmospheric Sciences. So Jay Malosh, in your, uh, one of the faculty members, has gotten incredible media. Yeah. He's probably the biggest uh, certainly one of the biggest circulated pr people because of marketing media has really gotten that research work he's doing on on impacts and uh, it, you know to the whole world so very very well known uh, so are there follow-up questions for yeah. Terry I see you yeah welcome Yeah, that's a really great question. And yes, there is, but not to the degree that we need them to be. Um, one of the things we need to do in marketing is to make sure that we understand what resonates with the audience that we're trying to reach and that the materials that we're creating have the same kind of impact in another culture. In order to do that, we need to do a lot of market research and a lot of testing within those customer segments and within those cultures. And we have not done a lot of that at this point. What we try to do is use our news service um, and our news releases in those countries to do a lot of the marketing leg work for us in terms of building awareness. Where I'd love to be able to go, and this gets back to the whole, you know, we're kind of going full circle with the discussion tonight, it gets to really a question of funding. 
and can we afford to build out the rich body of insights that we need and create materials in another language relevant to other cultures um, to be able to, are we gonna get back to the question about return? Are we going to be able to draw the numbers to, to justify that? But it's a great question, a great point. We're very interested in, in <coughs> proceeding with that. I have, a, I have a budget related question that was submitted and I think that it'll be of particular interest um, to, to all of you. Um, the, the question was, um, given, given what we anticipate from the state, um, do we have an idea of what the impacts to tuition or fees might look like? Um, do we know if it, I mean, can, can we say half a percent, can we say one and a half percent, or is there any confidence in that at this point, or is that a waiting game? Well, no. <laughs> we, we don't want to dive too deep at this. Um, we, we've been talking quietly with uh, the people that I mentioned earlier, with our, um, our state senators and with the Commission on Higher Education of what we're thinking about, if this, then that, and what we would need to recover um, and be able to invest in the needs that we've described, whether it's R&R, &R, we had a lot of discussion here about facilities or uh, research and its support, media and marketing, the classroom experience, academics, scholarships and all. And so um, I, I think we, you know, we're, we're gently, you know, waiting there. I, we don't have any idea what, well, we don't have uh, the final appropriation number, of course, and there are all these different budgets out there, from the governor's budget to the commission's budget to now the House Ways and Means Committee budget. They're all different numbers. And so I, I think that, that they understand some of the difference makers, uh, Terry, understand um, where, what, what kind of numbers we're, we're thinking about in order to meet all our goals. Uh, but we, we're not, we, we don't want to advertise them because we don't right. know the final numbers. But on the other hand, we promised no surprises to all our legislators and, um, and the commission. And so we promised we would have this transparent dialogue. And so we are, we are doing that, but we're just doing it at kind of a quiet level now until we have more information on what the final numbers. And of course, ultimately the trustees weigh in on what the, uh, the tuition and fees should be. So they're, they're the decision makers, okay? Yes, we got a lot of questions all of a sudden here. Greg, it's you it's quarter time. till nine. Um, I don't know, you, you guys, you guys are, are very busy people. Is it something um, should, I was going to offer at the end and I'm sure that the graduate student government would offer the same that questions or, or concerns that were unable to be voiced tonight. Um, we, I think we each have uh, an email address that we would love to give you um, to be able to share those concerns and we would hopefully be able to continue the dialogue offline. Um, we, had, uh, we had the room reserved in this schedule from seven to eight and your guys' um, great participation and, and your uh, thoughtful questions has led us 45 minutes over. Um, and, and so at the risk of keeping Is it you. Still free? It's still free. It's still, it's no problem. So as long, there are still cookies. There are still cookies. Um, should we? I, like I said, I would, I would yield. Okay. So I guess, I guess that means we're still going. Good try, Brad. <laughs> what, what if we say that nine is also, we sure. got to get everybody sure. back studying in their uh, residences by nine. Uh, my name is Steve Kimball. I'm a PhD student in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. And as a uh, graduate student, I know that I'm on, not alone in, in being uh, worried about the continuing rise in health care. And uh, we would like to hear assurances from you that Purdue will continue to subsidize our graduate student health insurance, okay. at least at the current rate, or preferably at a higher rate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, either Al or Jim, which, which of you would like to, to take that question? Well, okay, we, uh, Al, yeah. and, and also to mention the big health care study right, we have. That's yeah. go, go okay. Let me assure you that it hasn't escaped us that the fastest growing part of our budget is health care. And, uh, and so we have taken uh, an initiative to have a, a blue ribbon, uh, a, a faculty blue ribbon committee uh, that uh, uh, will be uh, reporting out within days. In fact, uh, the provost and I will be meeting with them, I think, next week uh, to hear their uh, first uh, uh, report. But, um, <coughs> uh, 
and so we're anxious to uh, address uh, all of the issues. Now, as you know, the, there's a difference between the way the, uh, the, uh, uh, the graduate students' health care program and the university's health care program is conducted. We're self-insured as a university. Uh, the, the graduate student health care program is funded through an insurance program. Uh, we are in the process of uh, um, uh, re-bidding uh, 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 that, and I can't uh, at this point tell you what, uh, what the outcome is going to be, but we're, we're anxiously and actively pursuing not only the university's health care program, but also the graduate students. And I, I'm hopeful that within days, We'll, we'll be able to tell you what the outcome of the, uh, that process is. Well, all, all I can tell you in that regard is, is we'll, uh, uh, we'll review it the same way we do uh, the uh, other health care program and hopefully be in a position to do that. I cannot guarantee that at this point. But I, I also can't tell you that it's going to do anything else because we just don't know what the cost is going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And John, John uh, gave me a preliminary report in terms of the status of the program, but I think it's, it's uh, as, uh, literally with, within days we ought to know better where we are. Hi, uh, Joe Harmark. I'm a junior in the College of Ag. Um, I have a question kind of in a broader sense, President Cordova, um, regarding your slide that outlaid our goals as an in institution. How do we measure our performance, those outcomes of, of quality, reputation, and impact, and, and, and how do we compare to other institutions, land-grant universities across this country? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and we do it in a, a variety of ways. There are, are surveys, uh, reputational rankings, uh, there's, you know, there, there must be dozens of them, but there are some prime ones that we and our trustees look at, like US News and World Reports, which has both undergraduate and graduate rankings. There are world rankings, the Times of London, Shanghai world rankings. There are rankings like the Wall Street Journal had a wonderful ranking, a survey of 800 corporate recruiters this fall, and Purdue came out number four in that. And US News and World Reports were the only um, Big Ten University in the last two years to go up at all, and we, we passed up, we went 10 position places higher among all privates and publics, position places. And so we are ranked now number 18th nationally uh, among public research universities. <laughs> we, we have a goal, we'd like to be ranked in the top 15 of all publics, in the top 50 of all publics and privates. We're very close, we're 1856, we'd like to be 1550 within that. Um, and so, so that's one, one types of rankings. But we, we actually have, it's interesting, and we can make sure that it's readily accessible on the web, but every December we report, board of trustees meeting, it's an open meeting, on our strategic plan, and we have a long series, your student trustee will tell you it is long, of <laughs> metrics, okay, that rank us in all different kinds of categories, from facilities and how well we're doing on budgets to you know reputational <laughs> academic programs, numbers of departments that are in the top few in the country and so on. And so that we keep a very close eye on that. I personally believe that rankings do matter, even if inherently they're biased towards, say, private universities because they can spend more money per students or you know, smaller versus larger, et cetera. I still think that if you take the ensemble of rankings, that that can tell you something about how well you're doing and where you need to focus more effort and whether we like it or not, there are people way far away from the university, prospective students and faculty and donors that, that actually look at that and take some measure of your university. There are many other things that you, you can't rank, obviously. How do, you, how do you rank the value of getting a Nobel Prize in chemistry you know, a couple of months ago and, and two World Food Prize winners within the last three years? Uh, there are, you know, how do you rank that we have a wonderfully happy campus where the <laughs> students treat each other with, with great respect and participate in everything, a forum like this. I mean, how many <laughs> Big Ten universities right now have a collection of great students, graduate students, undergraduate students, who are meeting to discuss 
you know, the, the status and the future of their university. Where does that go on a ranking? So there are a lot of important things that you know about that make you committed to the institution and add value, all the clubs and organizations you have and what your student leadership is doing and those kinds of things. But we do try to keep a handle also on the things you can measure. Um, what is Purdue doing to make sure that um, professors choose less expensive textbooks and oh, and that's a great question. Um, <laughs> like because no, the, the cost of textbooks is rising yeah, definitely well, absolutely and not like kind of waste our money with textbooks we don't use. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my understanding, but maybe your student leadership can tell you too, because a, a couple of student body presidents ago, one of the Eric's uh, worked on, <laughs> on this issue, and uh, getting your teachers to give you the, the names of the texts they were using enough ahead of time so you could go on the Amazon.com or some other source and be able to get that material. And I assume that's still going on, is it? Does yeah. It, yeah uh, Vice Provost Whitaker, he uh, commissioned a, a committee to go look into that textbook issue. Um, and we've drafted a, a textbook best, best practices for the university. Um, we don't we can't necessarily do a policy because of um, some faculty issues with a, a strict policy, um, but we are putting out a best practices document to send to the faculty, um, and also we're working on a textbook exchange that will hopefully be going up by the end of this semester, if not by the beginning of next fall. So we are working on that issue, um, and it's been a, a year-long process that we've been working on the textbook issue, and hopefully, uh, come next fall, you'll be able to see some benefits from that committee. Thank you, Jamie. Jamie Steiner, Vice President of the Undergraduate Student Body. Hi, my name is Teresa. I'm an uh, out-of-state student in engineering. And with respect to tuition, uh, how much consideration do you put in for out-of-state versus in-state tuition? Last time it rose, it was 5% for everyone. That's a lot more for out-of-state than in-state. Mm -hmm. Sure, it Maybe sure is variable percentages in the future yeah. if yeah. necessary? Yeah, we're, th we're thinking deeply about that. <coughs> I'll, I'll ask Provost Sands to say a couple of comments. We, d we didn't show you, but we, we have the data on showing where's Purdue uh, with respect to the Big Ten for both in-state and out-of-state students. For in-state students, we're at near the bottom, uh, relatively speaking, for tuition and fees. Some universities are nearly double what we are for in-state fees. Uh, for out-of-state fees, we're, we're, right, we're right in the middle, which means that our market advantage is just not, you know, it's not there. If we got higher, then we'd start losing some students. So that's a consideration. We also know that the out-of-state students are really, um, are, are, are paying at least, if not more, than their fair share of the cost of a Purdue education because the state funding is, is going down. So we're, we're very sensitive to that and we're, we're gonna be taking a, a close look at it, but part of it is since we are a state-funded institution, our legislators have to agree, and we do have a recommendation from the commission on which Keith sits, and, and Keith Hansen here, that was introduced to you earlier, is our <coughs> the student commissioner, and I know that it, it would be important, although they're really thinking about the Indiana students, it's important that what considerations we have for out-of-state students are appreciated by the commission, so we have the latitude to exercise on that thinking. But maybe Tim, you want to add a couple of things, or is that? Well, oh, I think you covered it. Okay. All right. Okay. okay well, just one more question. One more. Very bad. He's <laughs> had his hand up for us. Uh, yeah. uh, I'm Nick Robinson. I'm a senior in public health um, from Fort Wayne, Indiana. My question. This is an on. Okay. Um, my question is: You talked about wanting to use um, research commercialization to help fund some of the shortfalls. What specific initiatives are you guys uh, implementing in order to increase that, uh, that yield? But not only that, how are you encouraging professors to research in areas that we can then commercialize and help fill uh, the backfill? I know uh, Leslie Geddes in Biomed brought in something like $120 million in, in revenue to the university. Are we working to encourage professors to, uh, to you know, kind of not match that, but to, uh, maximize their contribution. All right, well my challenge is not to talk all night on this. Thank <laughs> you for bringing this up. It's a, it's a 
very exciting area. It fits right in with our strategic goal, which is called discovery to delivery. Actually, that we have much more creative talent among the faculty than we are presently able to invest in to take their discoveries to commercialization. And our faculty have told us that and asked us to come up with some new models that do invest in that. Because right now, they, uh, they patent their research. Sometimes they get a license on it. The university gets very small revenue from it when you give it away at that very early stage. And so they pointed out that they would love to go the full range if we could find the money to invest in what is called in the commercial world the valley of death, which is the whole development uh, uh, cycle of taking your research and doing a prototype and investing in it until you really can get a company to want to buy it or, or create your own startup around it. So in some areas, in the area you mentioned in particular in biomedical engineering, Leslie Geddes and the rest of the folks over there, they're fantastic, they're just great. We have this Al Mann Institute, some of you may know about it at Discovery Park. They, uh, they select with a, a lot of careful review of what the market opportunities are, individual faculty projects, they're funding about eight of them, including people like Graham Cooks in chemistry, a number of others, Elisa Panic, uh, uh, Panich in, in biomed engineering and they are doing that cycle for them, but they're limited to biomedical devices only, okay? That's the, the area, the sweet spot that Al Mann is funding us for that. There are lots of other areas on the campus in nanotechnology, IT, energy, healthcare, you name it. And so we now have a committee, we just started it about a few weeks ago that our VP for research and the head of the Purdue Research Foundation put together uh, comprising a lot of faculty talent. And we're putting together a model for how do we get the monies together, because we're not gonna take it out of general funds. How do we get the monies together to invest in that? And one is gonna be the monies that already spin off the Purdue Resource, uh, Research Foundation. But another one is our alumni who are in the world of venture capital and commercialization. They very much want to invest in this. That's why I have it on my list. I think it's a huge opportunity that we have underexploited at Purdue. And we're, you're gonna be seeing a lot of progress on this. And that's all gonna be to the benefit of our students because they're gonna be involved in this and just get more opportunities from it. Very exciting new area. It also ties to the new center we started in the Silicon Valley to bring more venture capital to Purdue and invest in our faculty. So I think we, yes. we better, but I'll, I'll be here for a, a little bit. So if you have questions, and I, I think some of our uh, administrators will stay too, oh, just great. to talk individually with people. Great, well just to great. close, uh, one, um, thank you the students for coming, um, and then help me thank uh, the incredible um, administration. <laughs> I want to say that that this is this is why I love student government, why I've gotten involved on campus. Uh, I, I get to have these types of conversations all year, and and, and this is a, a great opportunity that we were able to broaden the uh, input base. And so I appreciate all of you coming out and sharing your thoughts. Um, and I encourage you that if you have thoughts um, or, or opinions or questions in the future. Um, <laughs> to get a hold of the undergraduate student government. Um, if you just email studentgovernment at purdue.edu, um, it comes straight to me. Um, and how can they get in touch with the graduate student government? Just email Andy A. Robinson at Purdue. A. Robinson, Andy Robinson. Um, and, and he will uh, be able to take your issue on um, in terms of uh, if you're a graduate student. So. Uh, thank you for coming out tonight. I thank think there's you. coffee. I think there's cookies. You probably need it. Um, but I uh, appreciate it. Thank Thanks. you, Brad.